Now, in this series so far, we've seen that Samson struggled with overcoming temptations, dealing with his pride and with his wandering eyes. And as, as strong as he was outwardly, he was still a man, and he was still tempted. And just because he was outwardly strong didn't mean that he was inwardly strong. And actually, he, he's, uh, his inwardly man was actually very weak. He, he fell to so many different temptations. And last Sunday, we considered how Samson refused to take his God-given calling seriously of being both a Nazarite to God from birth and also being the judge of God's people. Instead of seeking God's will and determining how to best free his people from the Philistines and to lead his people, he only attacked the Philistines when he was angry, agitated, seeking revenge or, or trying to enrich himself in some way. He played judge instead of being judge. And this, of course, displeased the Lord. And I wish I could tell you this morning that uh, Samson learned from all of his shortcomings over the years and that by the end of his 20 years of service, he was a different man, he was a great judge. But unfortunately, I can't tell you that. As a matter of fact, the exact opposite thing happened. He not only continued to lust after that which he knew he should not have and boast about his strengths and his accomplishments, but he also continued to make very foolish decisions without ever considering the consequences that his decisions might result in. And yet as Bible readers, we know that the man who Samson was the day that he died was noticeably different than the man who lived for himself for most of his life. The man that Samson was the day he died was pleasing to God. So what happened? What changed? God gave Samson one last chance. One last chance to change his ways and become the man God wanted him to be. And he took it. Before we get into our study, I want to share one Bible verse, and it's uh, up on the screen before you. And it comes from 1 Peter 5, verse 6, and it's going to be at the center of our study. And it says there, Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. If you would have told Samson who had a mightier hand, him or God, he would probably be tempted to say it was him. But God's word says, humble yourself under his mighty hand, and he will lift you up. He will exalt you in due time. And that's what happened in his life eventually. Now let's turn our attention to uh, Judges chapter 16. The last uh, chapter about Samson's life begins in a very familiar way with Samson going into the Philistine communities and playing the same old games that he always did. But this time, he went to a city called Gaza. And it was one of the five major cities of ancient Philistine. And while there, he saw a harlot, a prostitute, whom he couldn't resist, and he defiled himself with her, as he had done with the other Philistine women of his past. And then God's word says in verse 2, When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place, and they lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when it's daylight, we'll kill him. So the Philistines saw a great opportunity. Samson was there. He was all by himself. They would, you know, maybe surround the place that he was staying at. They would, you know, keep watch at the gates, and they would get him in the morning. They would kill him. They would finally get rid of their enemy. But Samson somehow caught wind of their plan. And so the Bible says that he lay low. He lay low until midnight. Then he arose at midnight, took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders and carried them out to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. Now let's just think about this for a moment. Gaza was one of the five main cities of the Philistines. It would have been majorly protected. Those gates and those bars would have been massive. And instead of just busting his way through them so that he could escape, he lifts up the entire contraption, puts it on his back, and then runs, perhaps for miles, 
with these gates on his back. Now, would he have needed to have done this to escape? No. So, so why did he do it? Yeah. Show him how strong he was, right? And how mighty he was. It was a boastful display of his strength. So if we just look at these four verses, we see again his lust. We see his pride mixed with, uh, you know, this, this uh, desire for adventure and excitement. And that's what Samson's life was. It was just a game. Whatever he wanted, he took. Whatever pleased him, he went after. Same old Samson. Still playing the same old games. And why not? He always seemed to get away, right? Loved ones, this is a common technique that Satan uses to ensnare those who do not take their spiritual walk seriously. And Satan entices them to play with sin and to play with temptations until they lose their sensitivity towards sin and the real danger that sin poses not only to their lives but to their souls and to their whole eternity. He wants us to become desensitized to sin. He entices us to sin, and then maybe we do it. He tempts us, and we fall. And then he lets us go, and then we repent. And then he does it over and over and over again. Why? To desensitize us from the dangers that sin poses, So that he can eventually, at the end of the day, enslave us as he did Samson. Now, Samson thought he could continue this cycle forever. I mean, he was so incredibly strong, but he was wrong. Verse 4. Afterward, it happened that he loved another woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. So this was another Philistine, a pagan woman. And we're told that Samson loved her. But uh, we have to assume that this love wasn't mutual. How do we know that? Well, verse 5 tells us so. Verse 5 says, And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So unlike Samson's first love that we read about a few weeks ago, whose life was threatened if she wouldn't help them find the answer to the riddle, this woman was willing to betray her love for the right price. And they even tell her what they want to do with him. They want to bind him. They want to afflict him. And she doesn't care. She doesn't care. Verse 6. So Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. Openly she, she asks him this question. And we can imagine that uh, Samson knew exactly what was going on. I mean, what a suspicious question, right? Tell, you know, tell me your secret so that I can hurt you one day, maybe with it. Just maybe. And uh, he knew what was going on. Remember, he was smart enough to figure out the Philistines' plan earlier in Gaza, right? So that he could escape. He knew what was going on. But the crazy thing is, he played along with this game. He did it because it was just fun to him. It was exciting for him. He would show them again how strong he was and that nobody could capture him. He played along. Verses 7 to 9. And Samson said to her, Well, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other men. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, saying, they're staying with her in the room, and she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. So frustrated that Samson lied to her and frustrated that she didn't get her money, all of that silver that they promised her, she tried again to deceive him. And again, and again. And the second time, Samson tells her, well, if they bind me securely with new ropes that have never been used before, then I'll become weak and become like a normal man. But he lied and he got away. The third time he tells her, if they weave my seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, then he would become weak and become like a, a normal man. Again, he lied to her. And each time he managed to, to get himself free and to surprise the Philistines 
who were staying there in the house waiting to capture Samson. Did he never notice them? Come on. It says it like four times that they were staying in that house with her, waiting to capture him. Just a game. But notice something, loved ones. Notice how desensitized he's becoming. Notice how he's putting his guard down. He's starting to tell them the truth, right? He's getting closer to the truth. We know that his power resided in his hair. And his last uh, lie had to do with his hair. He was becoming less cautious. He was letting his guard down. Verses 15 to 17. Then she said to him, How can you say that I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death that he, tell, that he told her. Scripture says, He told her all of his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. She manipulated him. She pestered him until he told her the secret. And some people might blame her for this. Like, she shouldn't have bothered him so much. I would have given up too. He stayed with her. He knew what she was trying to do. Three times prior, they, they had tried to capture him. And she was leading the whole thing. Now, one commentary says, Delilah was a deceitful woman with honey on her lips and poison in her heart. Cold and calculating, she toyed with Samson, pretending to love him while looking for personal gain. How could Samson be so foolish? Now, we think Samson is foolish, but how many times, loved ones, have we allowed ourselves to be deceived by others, maybe through flattery or some other kind of deceit? And then the commentary says, avoid falling prey to deceit by asking God to help you to distinguish between deception and the truth. You know, Satan refers to himself as an angel of light, we could say, right? He, he poses to be truthful, to be just like God. He even uses scripture to try to lead us astray. That's what he does. He's the father of all lies. That's what he does. He deceives. And we need discernment to know what is truth and what is deception. Now knowing that Samson had finally revealed uh, his secret to Delilah, Delilah planned his capture. And this is how she does it. She lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Isn't that something? He told her the exact truth. And every time he had told her something in the past, she did it immediately. Why would he think this would be any different? She lulled him to sleep. And many Christians fall this way in their spiritual walk. They are lulled to a state of indifference where they no longer care about being vigilant against the enemy's attacks. They don't care anymore. They're indifferent. They're desensitized. And that's exactly what Satan wants. And then when we least suspect it, he reveals who he truly is. Not an angel of light, but a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Verse 20 says, And she said then to, the, uh, to Samson, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go as before at other times and shake myself free. And then, what do the next words say, loud ones? But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. The strength that he once had to overcome was gone. God was gone. Samson finally went too far. His lustful eyes and his pride had taken him further down the path of sin than he ever wanted to go. His life had become the embodiment of what John writes in his warning in 1 John 2, verses 15 to 17. And I read this a few weeks ago. It says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lusts of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life 
is not of the Father, but it is of the world. Samson, who could describe his life better than these verses? The lust of the flesh and the pride of life. Whoever lives this kind of way, the Father is not in him. Samson did not know that the Lord had departed from him. And how fitting it is, loved ones, how fitting it is that these two things that Samson struggled with the most, his strength and his sight, were removed from him. His pride was rooted in his strength. With his hair gone, the Lord had departed from him. But not only that, his wandering eyes, those wandering eyes that constantly lusted after that which he should not have, they were removed as well. Verse 21 says, Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in a prison. His strength and his eyes were gone. Samson, the mighty warrior, became a slave. Rather than kill him, the Philistines preferred to humiliate him by gouging out his eyes and making him grind grain. And Samson now had plenty of time to wonder if Delilah's charms were worth spending the rest of his life in humiliation. And there are many, many men who have fallen prey to similar kinds of women. And there, as he grinded the enemy's grain, He thought, I'm sure, all day long of his foolishness. It wasn't the end of his humiliation, though. The Bible tells us that the Philistines gathered together with great joy that their arch enemy had finally been captured, and they wanted to thank their idol. They worshipped an idol named Dagon for providing them this great victory, and they were going to offer him a great sacrifice as well. And so they came together and they rejoiced, proclaiming, Our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. No, Samson delivered himself into their hands. They shouted also, And our God had delivered into our hands our enemies, the destroyer of our land and the one who multiplied our dead. No, he, he, he handed himself over. A foolish man who did next to nothing for God, even though God had called him even before he was born. Then they called Samson out to perform for them. And the Bible says he did so. Now can we imagine, loved ones, being blind, being exhausted, being humiliated, and being laughed at by 3,000 people all around you? His foolishness had finally caught up to him. He had brought himself there through his disregard for God and the things of God. Through his lust and through his pride, he enchackled himself. Paul warns us of this in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 to 8. He says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, and he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap eternal life. Our consequences will come. The fruit of our labors will come, good or bad. And I think it's safe to say that Samson had finally hit rock bottom. But an interesting thing seems to happen when people hit rock bottom. They seem to humble themselves and and, and see their lives for what it really is. They're finally able to see past all the lies of Satan and see their own despair. And then, when their clarity comes back, they humble themselves. And 1 Peter 5, verse 6 says, Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. This is that verse. There in the temple of Dagon, the blind, weak, enslaved performer of the Philistines received clarity of sight, perhaps for the first time ever. 
And this clarity allowed him to recognize his great dependence on God. For the first time that we read about from his life, he prayed to God from the heart for help. And this is what he prays. Verse 28. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God that I may with one blow take vengeance on these Philistines for my two eyes. This time he, he asked God for strength. He didn't rely on his own strength. Loved ones, when he had his eyes, he was blind to his own sinful condition. When he had his eyes, loved ones, he allowed them to lead him astray after every pagan woman that interested him. But as a blind man, he could finally see his wretched state and his separation from God. In his blindness, he found clarity of sight. Now, does this remind us of somebody from the New Testament who first needed to be blinded before he could see? Yeah, Paul, or Saul of Tarsus. God's word says, that Saul from Tarsus did everything in his power to persecute the church, the, the Christians, thinking that in doing so, he was doing the will of God. But that was until, on his way to Damascus, Jesus himself appeared to him in such a, a bright glory and vision that he was blinded for a time. And Jesus tells him that he was actually working against God instead of for God. And for three days, Saul was left blind so that he could finally gain true spiritual sight, and he did. He became a Christian, and the Bible says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And not only did Samson, if we go back to Samson, not only did his blindness result in spiritual sight, but his weakness helped him to see his true dependence on God. In his prayer to God, he asked God to strengthen him one last time so that he could finally do what God had chosen him for. Verses 29 to 30. And this is what most people think of when they think of Samson. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars which supported the temple, where the 3,000 Philistines were. And he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all of his might, and the temple fell, and the lords and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. 3,000 people. Now we know from a previous text that during one attack against the Philistines, Samson killed over 1,000 of them. And here he killed 3,000. So th throughout the rest of his, his ministry as a judge, he did very little more to free his people from the Philistines. He took it all for granted. He wasted everything that God had entrusted into his care. So many Christians today think that if only they had more to offer God, then God would be able to do greater and mightier things through them. If only they were stronger. If only they were more gifted in some way. If only they were smarter. If only they could sing better. Whatever it is. But the truth of the matter is, loved ones, God is able to do the most through the people who recognize their complete dependence on him. Not the people who think they could do everything on their own. And here I think of Paul again. And we know that Paul was a well-educated, well-known and gifted Christian. And he knew this as well, unfortunately. And he was tempted by his own pride, Paul the Evangelist. And so God gave him a thorn in the flesh to humble him and to keep him humble. And the Bible tells us that Paul did not like this thorn of the flesh and that he even prayed three times that God would remove it from him. But does God remove it? He doesn't. But he does tell him why. He says to, to, to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And loved ones, Samson's strength was made perfect in his weakness. For the first time ever, 
Samson was doing exactly what God wanted him to do with the right motives. In his weakness, he found strength. And one author says, In spite of Samson's past, God still answered his prayer and destroyed the pagan temple and the worshipers there. God still loved Samson. He was willing to hear Samson's prayer of confession and repentance and use him this final time. And one of the effects of sin is it keeps us from feeling like praying. I think we can all relate to that, right? When we disobey God, what's the first thing we want to do? Probably hide ourselves from God as Adam did. It keeps us from praying. But then the author says, don't let guilty feelings of sin keep you from your only means of forgiveness, of restoration. No matter how long you have been away from God, he is ready to hear from you and to restore you to a right relationship with him. Every situation can be salvaged if you're willing to turn again to God. And if God could still use Samson's situation, he can certainly make something worthwhile of each and every one of us. And then the author concludes by saying, Samson's story teaches us that it's never too late to start over. However badly we may have failed in the past, today is not too late for us to put our complete trust in God. He had one day left, maybe a few minutes left, I should say, to do something for God. And he finally did it. I want to conclude with one more thought. In Hebrews chapter 11, we find the hall of faith. It's referred to as the hall of faith because there a number of heroes from the Old Testament are recorded. Heroes like Noah and Abraham and his wife Sarah. And then we read of uh, Isaac and Jacob, Joseph and Moses and many others from the Old Testament. And then in verse 32, even Samson's name is included within the list of Old Testament heroes. Now, Samson's name is listed in the heroes of faith not because he was a miracle child, not because he was a Nazarite from birth, not because he was a judge of Israel, not even because he was perhaps the strongest mortal man who ever lived. His name is listed in Hebrews 11 because he repented of his ways and asked God for one more chance to do his will with all of his heart, even if it would cost them his life. One more chance. Loved ones, how many of us fail to take our spiritual lives, our walk with the Lord, seriously? How many of us play with sin and temptation on a daily basis thinking, it's not so bad. I'll get out of this again. God will forgive me again. How many of us misuse our God-given gifts and talents and opportunities only to enrich ourselves in some way while neglecting God and the things of God? How many of us have grown blind to our spiritual condition, our weakness, our enslavement? Loved ones, what would our lives look like if the Lord would today show us the way that he sees us and give us true clarity of our sinful condition or our condition before him? Is he pleased with our lives? Is he happy with us? Or is there something in our hearts that we need to make right? You know, this kind of life, Samson lived this life for 20 years while being judged over God's people. He lived in his blindness until he finally saw the truth after his own eyes were removed. He saw that he wasn't living for God. He wasn't a strong man. He was a weak. He was a wicked and he was a selfish man. He pleaded with God for one more chance. One more chance. And God heard his humble prayer. And with his mighty hand, with God's mighty hand, he knelt down And he lifted up this weak, blind slave. He equipped him one last time with great strength 
so that he could finally do God's will with all of his heart. And he did it. One more chance. Loved ones, Jesus' love and grace and compassion and forgiveness are just as powerful today as God's forgiveness in the Old Testament. Jesus loves each and every one of us, and he died on the cross for each and every one of us. And those who humble themselves before the Almighty God will be lifted up by his almighty hand. Samson finally wanted to live for God and no longer for himself. May that be our wish as well. Amen.